Hi everyone, I'm Rayal Padamsi and uh, firstly I would really really like to thank the BIC, thank you Indira, thank you Ravi for having us here, it's really very very pleasurable for us to be here, although I'm not there in person, I know we're all going to have a fantastic evening together. Good evening. As you may know, my father, Alex, straddled many worlds from theater to advertising to public service communication to social activism. The one thread that linked all his endeavors was that he dared to challenge the status quo, dared to think in a different direction, and finally put all that into action. His choice in theatrical productions from Death of a Salesman to Tara, talking about gender discrimination, Evita, final solutions, addressing the Hindu-Muslim divide, all contributed to a sense of social activism and linked with the power of the theater. Through his advertising, he actually built enormous brands on the strength of his disruptive thinking. Be it the girl in the waterfall in Lyril, the strict matriarch called Lalita Ji for surf, he also repositioned condoms in the minds of the Indian consumers with the Kama Sutra condom. MRF tire sales figures rose exponentially through his MRF muscle man. He addressed so many critically important social issues like dowry, bride burning, road safety, the stigma of HIV AIDS, and so much more through his public service films, which were played in movie theaters across the country, trying to impact social change. Well, growing up with my father was a constant whirlwind of exciting and mind expanding events and engagements from the age of 10, whether it was going to different art exhibitions across the city, the ballet, Indian classical musical recitals, a tour of Maharashtra looking for interesting and unusual trees as he was doing a film on saving the trees, to exploring all kinds of theater here and abroad, from lunchtime theater to gay theater, to experimental theater, to Broadway and the West End. It was a smorgasbord of stimuli, which was an exciting childhood. And to top it all, we grew up in a house that was designed like a theater. So the drawing room was designed as the stage. And we had a beautiful terrace out there, which was designed as the audience. And every evening we had shows, we had workshops, we had theater workshops. We actually never ever had a television at home because we never needed one. There was constant entertainment and excitement going on through the theater and of course the creative arts. The kind, this kind of an upbringing definitely lends itself to an exploration of all kinds of thinking. And so we shared a lot of creativity. He and I worked on several productions together, shared our common love for all things fantastical, and yet were very clear that they had to have relevance, no matter how nuanced. He was always ideating, and that's how when he met Vandana Saxena Poria, the co-author of the book, the germ of the second book was born and came to fruition. Vandana and he spent many hours exploring and dissecting so many new and interesting concepts, ideas, life hacks, and the book was here as it is today. This is the outcome. So let me introduce you to our very, very prolific panel for today on the area of igniting a culture of critical thinking. We have with us, of course, Mohandas Pai, who was previously a board member and the CFO of Infosys for 17 years and is now the co-founder and chairman of RN Capital, chief advisor, Manipal Education and Medical Group, amongst many, many other prestigious appointments. He has served in the areas of finance, accounting, information, technology, human resources, corporate governance, social impact innovation, environmental conservation, policy formulation, heritage preservation, philanthropy, and the venture and startup ecosystem over a career spanning over 37 years. He was awarded the Padma Shri Award by the President of India and the Karnataka Rajya Sabha Award in 2008. Thank you so much for being with us, Mohandas Bhai.
Prasad Vidyappa is a fashion industry veteran with four decades of being in the eye of the storm. Prasad runs an event management firm that specializes in fashion shows and promotions. He particularly enjoys working with Indian textiles, heritage Indian textiles, and his work in Rajasthan, Karnataka, and many other states resulted in a major rediscovery of Indian textiles, which revived the fortunes of hundreds of weavers and craftsmen. His most recent shows were with the weavers, weavers of Banaras, whose work he showcased in both traditional and modern idioms. Welcome, Prasad. Judy Robi Bidappa is actually my father's niece by marriage and my cousin. And her father, Paul, and my mother, Pearl, were first cousins. All of us part of the shrinking Jewish population in India. We all shared and enjoyed a shared history and ancestry. Judy's passion is the theater, and she's considered to be one of the finest stage artists of her generation, from Shakespeare to Tennessee Williams, from Girish Karnad to Ira Levin. Judith has walked the boards for some of theater's greatest playwrights. She's also directed musical extravaganzas like Cat, Starlight Express, and Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat in Bangalore. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to the co-author, Vandana Saxena Korea. She is an OBE, an Order of the British Empire, and one of the top 100 UK India influencers. She's known as the human alarm clock due to her disruptive thinking, which ignites people into action. A chartered accountant from the UK, she has extensive experience in translating academic and industry texts into digestible stories and training exercises for corporates globally. Vandana spent three years collaborating with my father on this book prior to his passing. So get ready for a crackerjack evening of discussion, debate. There's a lot of audience participation along with some very, very relevant audience polls and some surprise unspoken dialogues. Over to you, Vandana. Thank you so much, Ryan. It's really great to have you. We're very sad you can't be here with us, but fantastic that you could join us. Um, it's up to you if you want to stay on or if you want to go off screen. I know you're going to be listening, but thank you for that lovely introduction. Thank you to Bangalore International Centre, to Indra, to Ravi, the whole team. And of course, these fantastic panellists that I have uh, with me today. So. So let's talk just very briefly about why we're here today. Um, the most vibrant times in humanity have really been where business and life have collided together. Um, and there's been a lot of learning from different fields. And critical thinking, I think, was at the heart of it. Uh, if we think about what critical thinking is, it's defined as the objective analysis and evaluation of an issue in order to form a judgment. Now that sounds really simple. Of course, we think about everything, don't we? And we question everything, don't we? Well, perhaps not. Over the years, the ability seems to have died down. And Alec in his book talks about how we've become a nation of unwritten rule followers and pretty much, no, no offense intended, outsourced our thinking. How have we outsourced our thinking? Well, um, think about this. If we go back a millen millennia or a few millennia, religion was there to guide us, but then it started become, becoming the rule maker. Monarchies and government create rules. They create systems that we're supposed to follow. Then celebrities and media tell us what we're supposed to wear. No offense. Um, and um, how, to, how, how to be, how to act, et cetera, et cetera. And then parents and society in general also put unwritten rules on us. So the question is, has this impaired our ability to think and question? Um, is this leading to a number of mental health issues where, where people are burning out, where people can't talk about what, what they're being affected by? So in the book, which is, uh, by the way, Penguin have put a stall outside. So if any of you are interested, we will be, um, I'll be signing and um, uh, there'll be an opportunity to buy the book. 
But in the book, Alec discusses a lot of the hypocrisies and the unwritten rules that we live by and the unhappiness that it's causing in the world today. And in true Alec Badamsi style, he also mentions ways to kind of shake up the status quo and perhaps do things differently. And I think our panel, and I'm really grateful for having these icons. Can we please give them another round of applause? Um, to have them on the stage. Um, one thing that Ryle didn't mention, but many of you may know, that Judy also was a national level sports personality. Um, so, <laughs> but you were, and you played at national level, and, and that's incredible. It takes some kind of grit to get to the level that these three have achieved um, on the stage. So our session today is really gonna examine the current state of, of the world. And we're gonna be doing a, a couple of polls with all of you too. So now, normally this is the time when the moderator says very firmly, are your phones on silent? Do not touch your phones. I actually do want you to be touching your phones. Why? Because we want you involved in the discussion today. So I'm gonna um, ask you a question. And it's very simple. This is called Slido. So obviously make sure your phone is first on silent. And then what you need to do is either click the QR code or you need to go to the browser and put the number in. And we just want to get a few stats of who we've got in the audience. So hopefully, hopefully some of you, well, we're, all, we're seeing it. That's great. We've got a few of you answering. We'll just give you a few minutes. We were very keen to make sure that we had a cross section of India here today. And I think, I think we do. Okay, this is good. This is good. We've got a, a nice cross section. And so it's really important to us that through the session, when we do the polls, we get you to answer. Um, everything is anonymous. We're not recording which phone number it's coming in for. And then we're gonna hassle you on social media about your answers. Um, it very much is just so that we know. So we'll just give you another minute or so. We're interested in knowing how old you are. And you'll see why when we come on to doing some of the questions. Okay, so I think everyone's got the hang of this. We're getting people to answer. This is, this is really nice. We, we needed more of the under 25s, didn't we? because we wanted to really try and represent India. So those of you under 25, we will be calling, well, we'll be calling on many people to give their opinions and uh, ask questions during the session today. Fabulous. Okay, one more question for you. Hopefully this is, yeah, there we go. Which gender do you identify with? Just so that we know. So either the women are very good at operating their phones or, um, or we really do have more women than men, in which case I'm very happy because as Mohan was telling us before we came on, there's now 1,020 women to every 1,000 men in India. So yes, just recently, just recently it's happened. And, and, and that bodes well, we hope, for, for the future. All right. Okay, I'm gonna start. There, there are three kind of chapters that we're gonna use as a basis to looking at critical thinking. And I'm gonna start with a chapter in the book, which is called School Versus Edutainment. If I can open my book, here we go. And I'm just gonna read a very short, short part out. Yes, I shall. I'll hold it, is that better? Okay. So a very quick bit, and then we'll get into the discussion. So the, the chapter is school versus edutainment, and the subsection is rules at school followed the rulers. For years, education in this country and almost all over the world was about rote learning. And unfortunately, Britain was in India during the Victorian period. If Britain had been our rulers after the Beatles, just think how different life would have been. The Beatles generation disrupted the culture of Britain completely. It was an exciting time over there where people were doing mad things that didn't have logic. 
No linear thinking, but squiggly thinking all over the place. If post Beatles Britain had ruled India, I think India would have been quite a different place. We actually had Britain ruling over us during its worst period, at its most conventional with don't answer back, little boys should be silent and only speak when they're spoken to. And as for little girls, dot, dot, dot. Um, and he goes on to talk about continuing this trap, uh, this time worshiping the false gods of education. And he says that um, when he was uh, talking to one of the principals of Xavier's college, and he was on the advisory committee, he said one of the main problems that students face is the teaching method. And the principal said, what do you mean? And he said, when I was in college, and I think even until today, most professors tend to dictate knowledge, not teach it. And it doesn't work for the students. The professors have a textbook with a syllabus and literally force it down the student's throat without any creativity. I think it's wrong. I think if we could make the students fall in love with the subject, then students would educate themselves. That the job of the teacher is not to tell the student, but to tempt the student to fall in love with the subject. I'm saying that education is for the learner to learn and not for the teacher to teach. It's for the teacher to infuse. Okay, so that's what Alex says. And on the background, or with the, that as a background, Mohan, you know, your experience at Emphasis, uh, you, you went from being CFO to purposely going into talent and HR, and now you also have Moneyball as well. So we have, I, I want to ask you one question first. Why do you think critical thinking is actually critical? I think critical thinking is critical because if you want to be successful in life, you have to be a problem solver. Now, principles of problem solving is very simple. There are problems and challenges because of a stratification of society, creation of rules which everybody has to follow, and that brings in rigidity in thought. Right. Now, if you want to be creative, you have to break the mold and make people creative. And when you're in a creative space, which also requires discipline, you have to do things very uh, differently. Right. So for me, in my career, what mattered most was my curiosity for learning, curiosity for asking questions. In fact, I got hired in Infosys because I went to the AGM and asked a few questions. So then they came and told me, why don't you join and answer them yourself? <laughs> so we had a culture of curiosity, culture of great debates, culture of dissent, culture of doing things very differently. And we wanted to set standards in everything that we did. It was a very exciting time to create a new industry, create the new India, and create a space where people could grow and create a new uh, kind of HR policy where the focus was on people, not a regimented kind of a company. So it was very exciting. And um, I went into a very difficult area, I mean, compared to what I was doing as a CFO, uh, primarily because Murthy told me, why don't you try this? And I must tell you this story, Vandana, you will understand this. The day when I became HR director, I met my team and asked them, okay, what should we do? They asked me, can we trust you? I said, trust me. I'm supposed to be the board member, why? He said, you were CFO, you didn't give us the hikes that we want, you didn't give us all that we want. I told them, we gave you the stock options, you became billionaire, millionaires, so many times over, I gave you so much, all that we did. Then I told them, till yesterday, if somebody walked into my room, I saw the person as a net present value of a future stream of income. <laughs> From today, if you walk into my room, I see you as a human being who requires empathy, who requires support, and who requires nurturing. So why was, why was this change in heart and mind? Because you change the job, you change the mind and heart. But wow. the key thing, what I want to say is, you know, young people are essentially rebels. Mm. A child is curious. A child is a rebel. A child wants to touch and feel and see many things. And that curiosity should be nurtured in school, should be nurtured at home, should be nurtured everywhere else. But, you know, in India, I don't agree with Al Q that the British would have been better ruling us. We'd have been better ruling them because <laughs> India throughout the civilization has been a very creative place. We are a very diverse people. Prasad has traveled all over India. He has seen some amazing things which we don't know. Every house is creative. The way we eat our food, the way we decorate our houses, the way we make our dresses, the things that we wear is very different. 
is the British to the industrial revolution it brought in standardization yes. and the education system is a standardized way of educating a large number of people because before then we had the Academy of Greece and the Gurukula of India. Yes. In the Gurukula, the theme was you stay with your teachers and you question them and you learn by questioning by debate. Mm. Nachiketa's dialogue with Yama is a fantastic thing that people must learn, how to debate and how to learn. And we've kind of forgotten how to do that. We've we forgotten that because the British, like you said, that I agree, yeah. gave us the worst of their civilization yes. and destroyed it. Now, if you look at successful people, I think you see them as iconoclasts, as people who broke the rules. And Alq, I think, was a, you know, was a very good well, a person who always broke the rules, yes. who always shocked people, who liked shocking people, who did things very differently because they enjoyed shocking people. And he was creative as a result. Look at Prasad Vidyapa. He's so creative. And he shocks people by his creativity, his curiosity, despite uh, you know, so many years of working in many, many multiple fields, right? Yeah. So I think that's the spirit that should be imbibed with you. So Lastly, Vandana, mm -hmm. You know, life is a many splendor thing. Mm -hmm. It's so joyful, so exciting. Every day is a discovery. Every time you go somewhere, open your eyes and see something, you see something so beautiful. And the simple joys of life is something that you must see and experience every single day. That's what makes life worth living. It's not the money that you have, the clothes that you wear, and everything else. It's a nice conversation. is seeing a beautiful bird, the sunset, the sunrise, sitting peacefully and doing nothing. Mm. Now, these are all the way we enjoy our lives and are creative. And that's what my understanding of this book is, that mm. break the shackles that bind you, break the rules. Rules are important. Mm. If you walk in the streets, you don't want a car running over you, right? Sure. You have to follow the rules, certain rules. But then your creative aspect is something that you can see yourself, you can do yourself, and you can make an impact. But you must do it yourself because you must lead the life that you want free of many things that bind you, yet follow some minimum rules in society to keep things together. No, really great points there. I think the one word that I heard you say like four or five times is curiosity. And that is incredibly important. Um, it's at the heart of critical thinking. But you're right, there is a place for rules. The question is, where does it get too much and where do we stop people? So a follow-on question from uh, for you, and then I'd... Uh, I, I'd like to go over to Judy and Prasad. Um, we've got 676 million people under the age of 25 in India. And there's a common perception that the education system in India hasn't kept pace with the skills needed for young people for obvious reasons. It's a huge, huge task to educate, you know, 676 million. But as somebody who has an insider's view on how curriculums are set, are set and how they're run, as well as what skills are needed. Um, what do you think is changing? And what more do you think needs to be done to inculcate critical thinking? No, to inculcate critical thinking in the mass of people, we need to have a flexible, flexible curriculum based on certain fundamental principles. Of course, you need an exam for whatever it is because you need the piece of paper for many things. So you need to have a, a school system where there's great freedom for the teachers to teach and the students to learn with lesser amount of curriculum. Today, there's a lot of information available, so you don't have to cram all that into your hard disk. Yes. Because all you have to do is search and you get what you want. Mm -hmm. But you have to teach children how to challenge established norms, how to be, think very differently, and how to be problem solvers. If you finish 12 years of school and you're a problem solver, I think that's fantastic. You could do anything. You could do anything. Yeah. You'll be very creative. You'll be highly successful in life. Yeah. And to be a problem solver, you must be curious. You must think. You must have a little bit of information and knowledge. And you must have enormous amount of energy and passion. Yeah. So I think it's happening in many different ways. The rigidity of the system is gone in the new education policy. I think it's a fantastic policy because it reduces the burden on the child. Mm. It reduces trying to make a widget of a child instead of making him an accomplished human being, making him or her an accomplished human being, I think is hope for the future. But to me, the teacher in the school has to do all this herself. Mm. It's a teacher who can do that. And the teacher is not bound entirely by the curriculum. I'm sure uh, Judy taught yeah. a school. She'll tell you how she taught those all those children that she taught, how to grow up and enjoy themselves. Who are the best teachers uh, you know, for you and all of us? The best teachers are who gave you that freedom who talk to you like a friend, like a parent, who allowed you to scream and to dance and to shout and to ask questions, bunk classes, <laughs> go away, come back, right? 
We give you the freedom, right? Yes. And they're the teachers that you like. So teachers can do a lot without being constrained. But I think that is where we need many more. Yes. Last point is no country in the world has been able to give 675 million people the kind of education yeah. you think everybody deserves. It's yeah. not possible. Yeah. There is going to be differences. We've got to learn to live with it. Mm. Fair, fair point. Judy, your thoughts on education and, and what's, uh, you, you know, the state of the country and how did you bring critical thinking in? I, I think it should be on. How did I, I, I didn't think about it at the time that I was teaching, but it just felt right. We didn't have all these discussions before, but I realized that the kids had to have fun and that was from sports and from theater. I, I was lucky, I was an actress. So I could do crazy things in class without feeling bad or getting the kids involved with maybe a theater game or painting a wall or different ways of teaching. So we allowed them. I was lucky I was in uh, a school where the principal allowed you to do what you felt the kids needed. So questions were answered in, our, in, in my classroom. Everybody was free. They may, may not have been free to scream and shout, but definitely they were free to question, to ask each other questions because children learn so much from each other. And if you allow that, if they're sitting um, in one place learning by rote, they fall into either bad behavior in class or Apathy, complete apathy. Just sit there and wait for the bell to ring. So if, if you want to have everybody engaged in your classroom, you need to do so much more than just stand at the head of the class. I was always to be found at the back of my class. And the kids were all over. And it, it was a culture there. Now, I'm not saying this is normal. Mm. India spends 3% of its GDP on education. Zambia spends 25%. So... It's a huge task. Mm. There are no quick fixes. Mm. But there are pockets. There are schools. There are um, initiatives working towards getting this to happen. So it's not all hopeless. It's not. And when I think about it, I was educated with the archaic system that the British mm. left us. I turned out pretty good. So I'm not That's, dissing it completely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and let, let me... Um, say something about learning by rote. It, we used to call it learning by heart. Yeah. Uh -huh. There is a new way of looking at learning by heart in Japan. They say without that, it's, your brain gets a little lazy. Yeah, so right. we are not saying all education should be by rote. But learning your times tables, learning something like a, a poem, to recite or to perform, you have to know how to memorize. And memorizing is not a bad thing. It's very, very good for a kid's brain. So it's got to be done in um, judiciously. Mm. It cannot be done for the whole curriculum. Mm. And there are people working on the curriculum today. There are friends of mine in education who are trying to change it in focus groups in the government. I think the government has realized. So what I'm trying to say is it's not all hopeless. No, no, I completely <laughs> agree. Just one question for the audience, actually. Um, is there a correlation between subjects you loved at school and the teacher that taught them? Just put your hand up. Yeah. Yeah. So, so one of the things that perhaps we need to do is just treat our teachers with more respect and love. Uh, because they are the ones that are spending so much time with our kids. Um, on that, I'm, I'm glad you like that, Indra, and I, I, I very, very much echo what you said. Um, a quick question for you then. The two different things. No, no, it, it, it says the same. Two oh, they are two different. Apologies. I can't see that part. So okay. So the first one says, it is the teacher's job to help the student fall in love with learning. The final mark isn't an important factor, but the understanding and love of the subject is more important. The second one says, it's the teacher's job to teach and for the student to motivate themselves to learn. It's hard enough to cover the curriculum. 94% of you absolutely say it's the teacher's job. So all of you who have got kids, a good question to ask you is how involved are you with the teachers? How often do you talk to the teachers? And is there more that you need to do? 
um, because it's easy to put the blame over there. But let's, uh, let's think about bringing it back. OK, I'm going to introduce another concept of Alex as well, uh, which is to do with his thousand best friends. And then Judy and Prasad, I'd love your thoughts on this. Um, leading on, and you'll see the link in a minute, a journalist wrote to me, uh, obviously Alec, a year ago asking me how many people I knew well. Not just acquaintances, but where I knew what made them tick inside. I called him back and told him probably about, I paused for dramatic effect, then said loudly, yes, probably about a thousand. He was quite in incredulous. A thousand people, really? Mr. Padamsi, I know you've lived a long life, but surely you can't know a thousand people that well. Who are they? So I said, you think so? Okay, I'll give you their names. I would start with Hamlet, Othello, Juliet, Romeo, Evita, Portia, Puck, Malvolio. He burst out laughing in total disbelief. The fact is, I do intimately know a thousand people. Do you know that I did 77 plays? So in effect, I have 77 different families comprising the characters, the cast, and all the supporting staff. Okay, so that was from Alec talking about theater. Judy, I, wa I wanna ask you about this. Theater and education, like you made your life, uh, apart from the sports, you really dedicated your life to teaching, and theatre. And Alec was big on having hobbies and passions. He said that theatre taught him so much that he could use in advertising and in life. And I'm really curious to know from you, what did you learn from the theatre? And why do you think theatre is important for an overall education? Oh my, that's a big one. Theatre teaches you along with sports. It teaches... And yeah, please talk about sports as yeah, well. Yeah, it's the same thing because it's teamwork. And it gives you a sort of self-confidence. So your personal and your social relationships, your personal and social development of the child, that is what I thought was terribly important, much more than the academics. So, yes, when the principal said, shall we do a whole school production? I said, yes, they learn so much more. And they did, they write to me now. They're like, I have, I have grand students. I mean, my students have children. So yeah. they still remember, they still yeah. remember the productions. They still remember how I gave them the responsibilities. You see, they still remember what they did and how their tiny little bit worked for the whole lot. And if families are like that, you see your, I believe in India, I think in all over the world. I mean, I know Alex says about five-year marriage contracts and stuff like that. But for me, the family is the unit. The children stay with us for a few hours a day. But what they learn at home is reflected in their behavior in school. So we try to make it a family, a family um, involvement with the child's development. And theater gives you that confidence just to stand on the stage just to stand on the stage. I, I used to make the kids do that and just introduce their friend. Mm. And I promise you, from crossing their legs to pulling their shirts, you know, it's, it's so obvious how nervous they are and how they can't. And the most difficult thing is to stand in front of you as an audience and stand still. I taught them that. I taught them that they were never to be afraid of speaking, never to be afraid of being involved, never to be afraid of walking on stage. And you know, they carried that into their lives as well. And they teach the children, their own children, the same thing. So theater, to teach teamwork, responsibility, to develop them, their social skills, their personal relationships. Casts that I've worked with for three months are, are lifelong friends. Mm. They, and you know, to be involved with another human being in this day and age of, of, of social media, it's easier for them. I mean, they're sitting away from each other here and talking to each other on the phone. I've seen mm. it. And yet when they speak to each other, they can't even look at each other's eyes anymore. They don't know what to say. So I feel it's a danger. I feel that theater would have, is, should save 
our children in school, theater and sports, extracurricular activities, all those things that develop your all-round personality. My mother was a sports teacher. I learned this from her. My father always said, don't pontificate, do something about it. So I made a fool of myself in front of my class and they loved me for it. But they learned. And they learned because they moved, they spoke to each other, they questioned each other. And it was, it was a glorious time, really. I, and I remember it with great fondness. And, you know, another aspect um, that I really learned from Alec was how well he knew the characters. I mean, the conversations yes. we had yes. about Macbeth, you would have thought Macbeth was his best friend. That's you know? the director's job, you see. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so the cast has one character. The yes. director has to know every single character. And the motivations of and each the motivations, of those characters. Yeah. And what does that teach you about life when you get to know these characters, when you see how they interact with each other? What does that teach that you? That everybody is not from the single mold. Yeah. Everybody is different. Mm -hmm. And you have to be accepting of that. You have to understand. You need not agree. You can agree to disagree. There are so many things you can teach them through characterization, mm -hmm. through improvisation, mm -hmm. through uh, learning about a crazy character, mm -hmm. a, a funny character. Mm -hmm. You know, there are, there are, you, you learn so much from characterization. You make them write a hundred, a hundred statements about who that character is. Mm -hmm. So if he, Alec wanted somebody to be playing Hamlet, Hamlet would write down his favorite food, his favorite yeah. costume, his, everything about himself. And that he'd stay true to that character. I used to also say that it's, it's pretending. Mm. Don't mistake it as a bad thing. You're bluffing, you're not that person. Because sometimes people tend to believe, you know, that they can do things in real life that they can do on stage. So you have to nip that in the bud with kids, mm. with children. Mm. When you're on stage, you're a character. That's not you, but you must learn the character. So it's, it's an exercise in understanding somebody else, which we're forgetting in this day of social media. Brilliant, really, really good point. Um, do you, <laughs> no, I totally agree. Um, Prasad, I wanna to come to you now. Um, I'm, I'm very curious, you, well, in fact, let me just ask the next question first. I'm hoping I've got them in the right order. Yes. Yeah. How important do you think it is to have a hobby or a passion in life that you take very seriously? Um, and I'm really curious to know this because although all of you are probably going to say 100%, how many of you let your kids do this? That's what I really want to know. Okay, that's good to see. It's good to see that some of you are putting your, um, your hands up on this because... Sometimes what we say on, you know, in one of these polls isn't actually what we're doing, but I hope you'll go back. And those of you who are grandparents, we were talking about the joys of being a grandparent. Hopefully you'll encourage your children um, to do this with their children. So having a passion or a hobby is serious. Your passion, however, became reality. You know, you were interested in fashion. And I'm really curious to know, how did that go down ba back in... 1960s, 70s, 70s, sorry, 1970s India? Well, um, I was lucky. My parents were quite fashionable. Okay. They dressed up a lot and went to parties. <laughs> so it was like, you know, you saw them getting ready and, and in the Air Force, which uh, my, my father was in, it was a life of parties, really. So, you know, in the nights, you'd see my mother getting dressed up and my dad getting dressed up. So it was just you know, par for the cause. It was a matter of cause, really. But uh, the thing about waking up every morning and being able to do what you're passionate about is something that I try to teach young people all the time. Because that's the only thing that would really make you happy, is if you're exploring something and doing something in an area that really turns you on. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was fashion. And my dad said to me, but uh, you want to study design? And then he said to me, but what is design, he said. I didn't really have an answer. Yeah. But uh, he said, will you be able to make money out of design? So I said, I hope so. But I don't think he quite understood till the end of his life what exactly I did. I'd show him ads in the paper from an ad agency and say, so we took this photograph and then we make the layout and Sunny over here write the copy. But he never quite got it, you know. But they left me alone to do what I wanted to. And as long as I wasn't asking them for money, they were fine <laughs> with it. So I think that's how it sort of worked out for me. But till today, I try to teach young people that you can find a way to do what you love. 
and it can mean less money, but it will mean a great deal of happiness and a great deal of satisfaction for you. The challenge that we have, though, is that um, our parents, for all the right reasons, the majority of India will say, you know, you need to do something that's going to bring stability. You know, we want to make sure that you're going to be, you'll be able to afford a house, you'll be able to have a family, get your kids educated, get your daughters married, et cetera, et cetera. And as soon as you bring in the idea of the arts, theater, fashion, et cetera, you know, the chances of that stability go down. So how do we convince, you know, so, and kids want to be, they watch Hollywood, Bollywood, um, they see fashion, they want to be part of that industry. And the parents are nay, nay, nay. You know, how do, how do we show them there is potentially a way? Can we? I, I think the new generation does exactly as it pleases. You know, our generation maybe listened to our parents and they said, be a doctor, be a lawyer, be something that you're going to earn a regular income with. But today, I don't think children really care to sort of listen to their parents about it. They tend to go their, in their own directions and become uh, fashion designers or stylists or makeup artists or dancers or, you know, they write a book quite early. It like, I think some young people whom we know like you know, have written books very, very early. So I think there's a generational change that happens. And I don't think that today's generation cares very much about owning a house or about owning a car. They know they can call a taxi in minutes. They know that they can rent a house and not spend all that money, which they'd rather spend on traveling. My daughter says that she wants to travel all her life. Mm -hmm. She doesn't want to buy a house or buy jewelry or anything like that. She wants to travel. And that's her main focus, to be able to even every weekend say, I'll go to Chikmagalur or I'll go to Kurg or somewhere nearby. But that seems to be their learning and that seems to give them joy. So good for them is what I say. Okay, brilliant. Um, I'm just I was interested. just I was just wanting to interrupt a little bit and say it's not all families. You know, we are talking about the middle class. Yeah, there are so many who are still stuck in in the grounding of doctor, lawyer, or whatever, engineer, accountant. Yeah, and See, sometimes we have two of them on the Sometimes stage. they're forced to do it, and they're so unhappy. And a hobby. Uh, you were talking about a hobby or a passion apart from your work, isn't that it? Yeah. yeah. So that I think keeps would keep a child out of trouble in these dangerous times. So, you know? so allow them to have it as a hobby. Oh, at yes. least let them develop the hobby. Yes. Um, this this next question is an interesting one uh, because it relates to this, and we'll come back. Who's more responsible for building critical thinking and values in the younger generation? Is it the parents, or is it school and education? Because we, we hear a lot, um, in fact, we just talked about it, that the schooling system needs to change. Is it the schooling system that needs to change? Or is it the mindset of parents? It's both. Please feel free to put your hand up and, and we'll bring you a mic. Yes, we'll bring the mic out. If we can... Or, or we have the mic at the front as well. So those of you... Of, co of course, to an extent, it is both. But I guess I'm saying, who's more responsible? Their peers, that's an interesting one. Yeah. I agree, I agree there. My father once told me, yes. show me, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Yeah. So, yeah. you have a point. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I got I this. Think, <laughs> I think most of you know that they're married, so <laughs> that's, that's a great one. Um, yeah, so, I, Mohan, would you add anything you on know, this? You know, Vandana, mm. you are... Parents have the greatest responsibility to children. Imagine that you're successful in your career, you've done very well in society. Mm. If your children don't do well as you grow older, you feel a sense of emptiness and disappointment in your life. Because at the end of it, your children are your future. And if you don't spend the time on your children, give them the value system, build up critical thinking, help them be successful, help them be happy and joyous, and you know that turn out to be people who are positive or whatever it is, what is the value of your life? Mm. I think for all parents, and you understand it only when you grow older. Yeah. You don't understand it when you're young, when your parents come and tell you, please do this, please, because they're all anxious. Yeah. You always want to rebel. Yeah. As you grow older, you have children, you're bent upon your career. You don't spend time with your children. 
but after you are past the age when you build a career you see your children not turn out well your life is devastated yeah and if you see your children turn out well you feel you're truly blessed and in every family and i would say it is the mother who takes the greatest responsibility mm. the father is often a stranger and it happens in every society that the nature of the beast and i think we should accept it for something for whatever it is and if the mother spends more time and the father you know today we want everybody to be equal i understand all that but genetically if the mother spends a little bit more time like for example she spoke so beautifully about bringing up children yeah can i speak like that can he speak like that no we cannot mm. look at the way she spoke because she is so passionate about engaging with children bringing them up seeing the joy in their face happiness when they do well critical thinking look at her expression right mm. I mean, I was wonderstruck with her, and I'm saying, "Oh my God!" I but wish I was, she had taught me. I was wonderstruck. Yeah, you... I wish she had taught me. Yeah, no, but I, mean, I... I had great teachers. I wish she had taught my children. But but I do want to add one thing, Mohan. When we were speaking earlier, I was wonderstruck on the joy that I saw on your face when you said yesterday you spent one and a half hours with your grandson. Yeah, because you know, I never spent time with my children when I was uh, you know building my career because I was always running up and down. and i missed the seeing them grow up yep. and i mean i left my job and said i want my life back yep. they asked me what do you what do you miss i said i miss seeing my children grow up i regret very much now and that's and what alex said it. as well they turn out to be they don't to be very good kids yes. but i'm i'm so happy because my wife sacrificed the career sent to them and she told me one important thing you know i don't want to be you know talk about how people should behave but she said when when i when you know i was a mother and the child comes home full of joy wanting to tell the mother about uh, you know what happened in school and everything else they're so very happy and the mother is not there there's a servant they're looking after the disappointment the child gets something i could not bear so i said i'm going to be there i'm going to take care of them i'm going to listen to them i'm going to do with this blah 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 but they turn out to be good mm. now i'm so happy mm. but i don't take credit she take credit so when i see my young grandchild only 15 months old I spend two, three hours on a Sunday or every day. I feel so happy, mm. and I feel so strange. My life is fulfilled. Because please remember, the most important thing is, you know, you grow old, and then when you grow old, you look back on your life. What is the greatest success you can have? To me, your children have grown up well and become good people, and they're happy. That's the greatest success you can have. And I, I have to tell you, Mohan, honestly, if Alec had been alive today and here on this stage, he would have echoed. everything you said everything his biggest regret was not spending time with his kids enough time growing up so the question that i have for all of you actually is fine you know that you made that mistake are you telling the younger generation the males of the younger generation that they should be spending more time with their families you no know, vandana that is why a family is important grandparents are important parents are important and we understand young people want to build a career they are that phase of the life when they want to do something achieve something is a passion they cannot take time off so as as grandparents you must spend time with your grandchildren you must live in a family maintain the relationship siblings are important cousins are important a big extended family is important because they are the ones who give you support this nuclear family is something that is turning out to be a disaster for most people primarily because children don't have the luxury of an extended family working with their cousins playing with them beating them talking to them and meeting with a lot of elderly people who come and teach you everybody says the grandparents who teach their children about many things the parents cannot teach because parents are young mm. that's the way of life and i think we must start accepting that and invest more in building relationship and keep the relationships alive to me that is what uh, i have learned in my life now keep all the relationships alive with your extended with sibling cousin everybody and spend time with them when you can okay prasad do you agree disagree do you think men need to take you know they can be passionate about their work but they should take time out for the family or you know what are your thoughts on this well i think they should i don't know how many of them do I tried and spent quite a lot of time with my children but I don't know whether it worked for them or worked for me but uh, if I, I had sorry if I had my time again I wouldn't work I would have been at home I'm I know some people may be shocked to hear this but I just told my daughter that if she wanted to have a child she's not to work not in this day and age because of what's out there especially the social media the pressures yeah 
So uh, he disagrees entirely with me. He wants her to have her Well, can, uh, her I, can I just say that I back you up. Mohan's known me for years. I ended up, when I got divorced, I ended up completely changing my life and getting rid of my company because I wanted to be there for my kids. Yeah, yeah. And there was no other way to do it. Yeah. So I, I do get where you're coming from. Yeah. But I, re I resent that I was forced to do that. I do resent that I was forced to do that um, because I, I, it's not that I wanted to run a billion dollar company. I, I don't think I ever had those aspirations, but I knew I could do more there, but my kids were important to me. So I get that. Um, and I think that's the same thing Mohan was saying about being a nuclear family versus a joint family, because a joint family can, you know, pick up a lot of the slack and sort of get... <laughs> well, it's a scientific fact, I believe. I was told by, uh, on very good authority, a lady called Mrs. Jyoti Tyagarajan, that grandparents are there in, in no other animal after you're past your childbearing or your um, baby bearing age, do you live as long as a human being? Mm. And they have discovered, it was on National Geographic, mm. that it's because of our worth as grandparents. So yeah. it's scientific what you're saying. Can I, can I also add one other thing in true Alec fashion? There's no other species on the planet where the female is expected to mother the children, look after the husband, look after the in-laws, and look after the parents. There is no other species on Earth. So it's, it's a question mark for me in my mind about whether the social norms that we have are, are you know, really Wandana. good for this modern for When modern you get life. to be 60, 65, what do you think is a life's greatest accomplishment? Uh, I, I mean, it is. It, I, I think it's your family and making sure that everyone's happy. I don't, I don't disagree. I'm just saying that even if you look at dolphins, if you look at gorillas, you look at the communities, they run as communities. But it, it, the pressure is not on the woman to play that role. They all play the role. And that's my point. And on that point, I really... Um, one, one thing that Alec did, many, um, may, maybe some of you know this, he was very um, intent on getting opinions from the audience on what was going on in his plays. And one of the things that he discovered was that people had what he calls unspoken dialogues. There are things going on inside them that they want to talk about, but they often don't. And he ran a series of plays based on the unspoken dialogues. Now you've heard from all of us, now I'm, I'm 51, and the rest of the audience, I, I, I think, 64, are, are almost. older. <laughs> are older. I would like to invite a younger person to come and give her take on this. It is an unspoken dialogue, which means she's really going to be speaking from the heart. And I would like to ask you to respect the fact that she is speaking from the heart and not discuss what she talks about with name outside of this place. That's the sanctity of having the unspoken dialogues. So Ritu, I know you're in the audience somewhere, but I'm not sure where. Ritu, do you wanna come down? We have a mic down here. I'd, I'd love to hear from you. Ritu is 18, is that right? 17, she's just finished her 12th. And um, I met her earlier this week and we had an interaction and she's gonna talk about her unspoken dialogue. It's, it's over here. There you go. So Ritu, the stage is yours. Just... Is this on? Okay. Hi. So um, I was at Inventure Academy and I met Mam over there um, for this teacher training thing. And what we did, we talked a lot about a bunch of values that students and teachers should induce in their teaching and talk about to make learning so much better. So some of the things that I talked about, we were put in a bunch of groups and we were to talk about what things could have gone better, how everything could have been so, so, so much easier for students to learn. So some of the values that I talked about were empathy and belonging. And these were really, really strong emotions and values for me, considering everything that I have personally been through. I struggled a lot with anxiety throughout for almost four or five years. And having that conversation with teachers, it was such a, such a big moment for me to like 
make people understand that there are a lot of students and teenagers who face these types of issues. And these teachers, obviously, they're so much older than me, and I feel like there's so many different learning blocks in um, learning. <laughs> there are naturally so many learning blocks when you're going through whatever you're going through, and it's so much more difficult to understand a student and figure out specifically what they need, right? So what we did when we talked about these things, I opened up to my teachers and I said, so I wasn't able to finish assignments because I couldn't focus on anything except myself at that time. And I think one of the biggest things that I struggled with personally was opening up about that topic because, um, no offense, this is a very beautiful country, I love it here, but society is really, really difficult over here. It's so hard to open up about these things. Mental health is such a taboo topic and it's so difficult to just come out and say, hi, I'm struggling over here and I need help because nobody can understand. Maybe they do, but nobody can understand what's going on in your mind, right? It makes so much things, it makes everything so much more difficult. So what exactly I personally struggled with for two, three years, I was completely alone. I couldn't open up to anybody. My peers, they wouldn't understand. Um, my parents, they do understand, but for a very long time, I wasn't sure if they'd be able to. I thought there would be a, so many different blocks. Maybe they wouldn't understand me. Maybe they'd think I'm completely different. They don't know what's going on. And I just felt so completely alone in my mind and alone with myself and my family at school everywhere. And I didn't know how to open up about everything. And I feel like maybe if we talked about this, these things much, much more, it would be so much easier to just come out and say it, right? And if people could just talk about it, maybe I could have had a much better schooling experience. Maybe I could have gotten better grades because I know that maybe there's a certain time for me to focus on things and there are other times where I can focus on my studies. And it, studies wouldn't just be the only expectation from me. Maybe just striving for happiness, striving for mental peace would also be a thing that I could work towards. But I didn't know at that time, I didn't know how many people could understand me, how many people would be able to see, yes, this is exactly what she needs. Give her a break. So it was just me and myself and I just had to survive through all of that by myself until I had the courage, which was another value that I picked up on. I had the courage to come clean and talk about this stuff. So yeah, I struggled a lot, but I'm still here. So Thank that's great. You. Ritu, what about the um, expectations of society? I think, celeb you know, yeah. the whole celebrity, the whole, you, you know, everything, just expectations as a teenager. I'm interested in knowing, you know, not just for you, but for your peers. Mm -hmm. What what have some of the challenges been? Social media. I think every single one of my friends are on Instagram and they're browsing, trying to become the next big influencer or something like that. And it gets so difficult to keep up with because what people post online is the highlights of their life, right? Highlights, nobody's life is perfect, but posting things on social media makes so much, um, it makes people strive for something that isn't real. And it can be so much more difficult to just compete with that, to live up to those expectations, right? You're always trying to be somebody you're not. And it gets so difficult to maintain a difference between who you are and what you want to be, what you can never be, right? And that can get so confusing and so draining, just constantly living up to something you're not. So biggest expectation is just living a perfect life, I think. Thank yeah. you. Ritu, thank you so much. Can we give her a big round? A big round. <laughs> 18 years old. And, you know, Vandana, uh, yeah. it's 17, very, 17. Yeah, it's very difficult for young people growing up today than the times when we grew up. There was no TV, there was no internet, there were none of these things. So you went to the library, you read, you played sports, you met with your peers, you went loafing, you went for a walk and uh, just spent time chatting, right? Bicycling, cycling, walking, running, playing. You went to see a Ranji cricket match. The stadium was full. Now nobody goes for a match, test match. You used to go, spend five days watching the game. Five days, you went for a music concert, 
I think we all grew up in an environment where there's no pressure. Now there's so much of pressure on children. It's very difficult for them, like she said, to express themselves, to understand what they're doing. It's a, it's a different age. Yeah, absolutely. And here's, here's a request from Alec from the other side. And that is when you do go home tonight, if you have a child, really ask them, how was your day? What are you going through at the moment? And listen without judging them, because that could be your Riddu moment. That could be your moment where your child um, or your niece or your nephew perhaps opens up a bit more to you. And grandparents, you have an even bigger responsibility because you know your grandchildren are probably going to open up much more to you uh, than anyone else. And those of you that don't have any of those, just ask your friends. Because I've asked this question to everyone from street cleaners to prime ministers to the monarchy in different countries. Um, and they're all going through the same insecurities, but nobody talks about it. So the unspoken dialogues are really important. If we can create those safe spaces, it can really, really make a difference. Um, Prasad, what do you do? You work a lot with young people. I think in the fashion industry, I'm gonna make a big generalization, but people seem to be much more in tune with their emotions and willing to, to talk. Do you find that or? We take young people through a training period where we try and teach them how to live literally, teach them live life skills and give them sort of hacks on how to cope with the world around them. It's fiercely competitive, but on the other hand, the fashion industry is also very accepting. I think it's the one industry which never asks what caste you are. Nobody cares. Nobody gives a damn about it. It's all about you. You know, how you look and the way you can cope with, like Julie said, walking on stage or being confident. So we try and teach that, you know, and maybe in ways we teach them also to have a facade so that you don't really see what's going on at the back. And you try and make sure that the world only sees the positive parts of you, like the young girl was saying about, you know, uh, being fiercely sort of... Um, very into giving out this very positive image, a very glamorous image of yourself all the time. But I think that young people find their balance. Yesterday, there was a friend of ours who was saying that her son graduated, five years of architecture, slogged the course. And then the day he graduates, he goes for an interview with Google and gets the job. I mean, that's fantastic, isn't it? It's just wonderful because it shows that you could have been pushed into becoming a doctor, a uh, engineer, a lawyer, but at the end of the day, you could go and become Deepika Padukone's makeup artist, you know? You could be whatever you wanted. I think India does give you the chance of reinventing yourself, of becoming something that you never expected to be or your family never expected you to be. That option is still open. That's great. Uh, Judy, would you add anything on that? It was just about to, he teaches them how to walk, how to behave, how to groom themselves. I teach them to, apart from on stage, uh, coping on stage when they have to, because sometimes they have to make acceptance speeches, sometimes they have to win something and say thank you, or how to actually just walk from backstage onto, onto the stage. I teach them two very important things, that when they're on stage, they switch on a switch. There's a switch on and there's a switch off. So that is not you on the stage. Like he said, the facade is not to be carried into real life. And I also teach them to say three words. No, thank you. Because in every profession, you get people offering you anything over there. And I said, don't afterwards come and blame anybody else. You have the right to say no, thank you to anything you're offered if you don't want it. So they do the technical stuff and I do the theater and the life skills. So you know, I want to ask Prasad, Prasad, how do you train people to handle failure? You know, you have so many models come to you. Everybody sees this glamorous world. I want to be successful. I want to walk the ramp in Bangalore, in Paris, in New York, London. You know, and you give them that hope, but not many can succeed. Many yeah. fail. How do you teach them to handle failure? How many actually don't make it? Realize the dream is that they come. How many make it? And what does it take to be really successful in a very esoteric, very finely tuned, very winners take all world. Well, we get a, like in a, in a normal audition every year, we get a thousand young people coming to us and only about a hundred make it through the first audition. So we try and teach them that rejection is nothing personal. 
and said, you're maybe not ready now, but you could get ready next year. We tried to soften the blow, but in the 100 we choose, only 50 will make it ultimately in the industry. The other 50 will fall by the wayside, or maybe some of them have just come to learn a thing or two and are not very serious about pursuing you know, fashion or modeling or glamour as a career. There's, so, there's what he says. There are lots of parents who send their children for grooming. They're not like actually a like a finishing school, but we don't call it that. We, we call it stage work or just making them more confident, self-confidence. I mean, you can do it for mums and dads, mums who, who, who need help because their husbands are in, the, in, in, in a corporate life and polite conversation, manicure, pedicure, whatever it is, just walking, how to walk with confidence. It's a skill in that, how to stay still, not fidget, just be calm. All those things are, can be taught. And the ones who, who, who don't make it, we tell them, look, it's a very small percentage. So he always insists that they finish their studies. So it's never all, all in. It's always your studying. Deepika Padukone's family, Anushka Sharma's family. He's the one who insists. She said, no, I, I, I don't want to study. She's such a clever girl. But he insisted. And then they finished and they're, they're both doing very well. I mean, that, that was just, it just happened. It's not the norm, but you, you make the them finish their yeah. studies. Yeah. yeah. And it's also, I think, an industry where rejection is at an all time high. You go to an audition, there are 10 girls. I mean, Anushka went for an audition. There were 500 girls for the film that she ultimately got, which was called um, Rabne Banadi Jodi. And she was girl number 234 auditioning. She gave her audition and she got the call back the next day. But everyone knows that rejection is part of the game. So after a while, they stop caring so much about it. Yes, we got the job. We didn't get the job. But you keep going. You know, young people are very resilient, very you know. Resilient. And they really, I think the new Indian has a very thick skin. It's really, I, I mean, I, I sometimes have to tell young people, look, quit because you're not going to make it. Yeah. And you don't have the requisite height or whatever for what you want to do. But you could become a television actor because you switch on the TV and you see the old and the young, the dark and the fair, you know, the pretty and the not so pretty. Everyone's on TV. So everyone can get a job at some point in life. You may not become a ramp model. You may not become a print model, but you could definitely find a niche in the industry that will accept you. So we say keep looking, you know. So. Yeah, brilliant. So, so what I'm hearing from you, Prasad, is um, in terms of dealing with failure, just going through the system itself teaches it. People are becoming thicker skinned. They're getting, um, they're getting used to it. And they're also realizing there are other things that they can do. Um, I think um, also Carol Dweck, I think her, her TED talk, which is uh, all about growth mindset, is, is something that I've taught in schools. And I'm sure, Judith, you have which is there's no such thing as failure. It's like Edison said uh, when he invented the light bulb, uh, a journalist came to him and said, how does it feel having failed a thousand times? And Edison just looked at the journalist and said, I didn't fail a thousand times. I took a thousand steps to get the, to this solution. Where's the failure in that? So the way we look at it, again, comes back to schooling and our parents. If our parents are going to make us feel bad because we got 96%, instead of 99%, we will feel like a failure. But is there no, anything- No, Vandana, we have to be self-motivated. To be successful, you have to be self-motivated. Right. If your motivation depends on external stimuli, like giving a promotion or getting more money or getting some honor, getting this, you're going to be a failure because somebody else is going to control you. You've got to be self-motivated and say to yourself, I want to do it. I want to succeed. I'm going to achieve that. And if you don't recognize me, it is fine because ultimately I'll succeed. And in society, those who do well always succeed. Those who do well, no, you can't ignore them. And if so, nobody, nobody gives you the respect or the bow for success, forget about it. So long as you satisfy yourself that you are self-motivated, you have done your best and you find happiness in what you achieve. I think that's fantastic. It's like doing a, uh, like take her, taking her case, take, doing a great act, uh, act on the stage and expressing yourself and feeling happy about it. If the audience don't clap for you, it is fine. So long as you feel happy. So you must make sure as an individual, you're self-motivated and you do something which gives you joy and happiness and not let somebody else control you. 
once you let somebody else control you you're gone absolutely and and i i think that deserves a round of applause and that's and that's really what it's about if we uh, if we've outsourced our thinking to others if we bring it back to ourselves and decide this is how i want to live it it does make it easier but i judy i saw you <laughs> just going no if they don't clap for me how am i going to feel tell me tell me it's very nice when you clap if you're on stage i mean not here in a performance <laughs> Yes, <laughs> it feels wonderful. It feels on stage. Yes, just so, uh, just yeah. telling you. Yeah. Just to get back to the previous, uh, <laughs> you know, Vandana, things change so fast in our country. Yeah. You know, at one point, a model had to look almost like a Caucasian. The fairer you were, the better it was. The if you had blue were. eyes like Aishwarya Rai, you were made. But you know, things have changed so much, and now we get a lot of demand from agencies around the world. asking for models whom they say must look indian now how do you define indian wow. you know yep. so the bridgerton i have any of you all bridgerton, watched yes. bridgerton yeah yeah so the bridgerton uh, sent us a casting call maybe about a year ago saying that they were looking for two girls who ultimately played the sharma sisters and every girl we said they said this she doesn't look indian enough and she isn't dark enough and i'd say oh really and then we would trawl through our books and find girls who very you know sweetly describe themselves as wheatish complexion dusky dusky dusky, dusky. 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 And we would try and send <laughs> them and and they would say no they are not dark enough yeah. and then ultimately we gave up on the casting and they found two girls in england who played the sharma sisters and what do i see they are painted yellow i mean if dark is what they wanted what were they trying to do they were the i mean i've heard of red indians i've heard of black indians i've heard of white indians but the first time i was seeing yellow indians it was really the strangest thing uh, yellow is on the on the makeup it's on a the tinge that they know, use foreign makeup artists think that uh, darker indian girls should be given a golden base it's very much like the tamilian servants who put haldi on their face and do you know that yeah, yellow yeah. for no, two days of gun snow But whatever it is but things change yes. so today a boy who comes looking like tall dark skinny not very muscular a face that could come from tamil nadu or from bihar or from wherever is on you know you're on and you can get work and you do get work now So there is a churn happening right now which I think is quite wonderful. Really. Brilliant, brilliant. And I'm glad you talked about that. There is a change. And one brief thing that I want to ask you uh, because this is one of the chapters in the book as well. Things are going to have to change. We've got more young people coming into the workforce. We now have a workforce that really spans five generations um or five decades uh, actually working. and if you look at who's buying and consuming the products they're very very different audiences so alec was very much a believer that you had to change the workplace to mix it uh, to mix it up so one of the things that we're very interested in knowing is job titles are very boring um i think alec was dead against the idea of the ceo he used to say chief executive officer exec- executive it's about executing So let's get rid of the chief executive officer. He came up with lots of different names. Chief stimulation officer. They should be stimulating people. Well, chief he was visionary. chief disruptor himself. He was, he was the chief CDO without a doubt. Um chief visionary officer. He talked about. So all of you, if you could rename your your title, you said your chairman of RN Capital. If you changed your name, what would you say it was or your title? Well, uh, cross pollinator. because you know fantastic you should not be a person who controls for example it's a chief disruptor you're controlling you're disrupting right cross pollinator is the one who is a facilitator who helps everybody else creates a ecosystem and makes the entire thing look much better and that gives you everything that you want fantastic yeah okay what would you say prasad i think so i think uh, chief pollinator is wonderful if you could pollinate and sort of scatter new ideas yeah. you know and grow new things new ideas out of it why not because in india really i mean for me the worst thing is that not everyone has access to education and to a better life until we can do that we really cannot claim we've progressed at all 
I work with schools like Parikrama, with Shukla Bose, where I see young people come from backgrounds where they really don't stand to, you know, get many chances in life, but they come in, they're educated, and all of a sudden, they're on par with anybody else. They could go to an interview at Infosys and get the job on merit. So when do we start educating? When do we start making it something that is compulsory, is you know, the rule, the rule of law that says a child must be educated. We have to do that. And until that's done, we've not achieved very much. Fair point, fair point. Is, would, you, would you say there's a more appropriate way to call a teacher a teacher? What else would you call them? Is it? That's what I call a teacher. Yeah. Uh, a chief engagement officer. A chief engagement officer, yeah. <laughs> So in my company, I've gone from being a CA to a CA. Um, I am a chartered accountant by profession, uh, but I run a company called the Human Alarm Clock. And Alec kind of christened me with the name the Chief Alarmist. So that's who I am, <laughs> which is why. You know, Guru. Guru is, is, is also a Because really it has one. a certain connotation. You know, it is very expansive. And teacher is a great, great word to describe people who teach you. Guru is somebody of reverence who takes care of you, is a father, is a mother, and is a teacher. Everything rolled into one. Yeah. And a person you can always go through. The Indian word guru mm. is such a great word. That's it's what I think. It's a beautiful word. Yeah. I, I, I would say in the new sense of the word teacher is one who shows the way, who doesn't force it down your throat. She, he, they lead you in a direction where you can learn. They show you things. They discuss things with you. They, they engage you. So... so if you look at the word education, it comes from the word educos. And educos means to bring out that which is within. Yes, that's perfect. So that is, you know, for me, the ultimate. That's what a real guru does. Yes. Yeah. Brilliant. All right. We have 10 minutes left. Um, I, I would like to do one more unspoken dialogue. Um, so I want to know if Twinkle is here. Twinkle. Twinkle, would you come up and do a quick unspoken dialogue? This is... Imagine Ritu, who spoke earlier. This is 10 years later, and we're just going to hear two minutes, and then we've got time for maybe 10 minutes of questions with the, with the panel. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Twinkle. I am 28 years old. I can give you like a bit of a background about my life. I come from a Sindhi family, which is kind of like a close-minded family where they have the life plan set for their children. And as I'm not sure if you've heard, but a lot of Sindhi families have their family business. So I was also a part of that plan. I uh, was not planned. I was supposed to be a boy. And I'm kind of halfway there, as you can see. <laughs> but uh, like, I don't know how to say this. Like. When I was born, I, I saw my, my parents go into the family business. I saw them how, I saw how they worked, and I kind of picked up on that. And they saw some spark of that in me, and they just planned my life plan right there. Like, okay, this one's going to run a family-owned business. She's going to sell clothes all her life. And I was not given a choice of what I want to do with my life, what, about, what were my opinions, what was my identity, my personality. Nothing. It was all planned, and I had to just go with it. And in the end, it got a little too much for me because I, I started struggling with being happy with myself. And in the end, I had to fight back. I had to tell them, I can't do this. And I had to choose a different way to study. In the end, I had to stop studying and just move out. I had no other option. I couldn't. I couldn't explain to them that this is who I am. I, I am not the person that you want me to be. And I had to move out. I had to go live by myself with my own rules because that was just not a safe space for me. For me to grow as a person, I just couldn't get that. Twinkle, how did you get the courage to do that, though? Well, in a way, I found a lot of people that inspired me, a lot of friends who were kind of going in a different direction as their parents would want them to be. And I saw hope. I saw that, okay, I'm not, I'm not, going, I'm not the only person 
to feel like this. And I got inspiration. I met a whole bunch of people. I, I even met somebody on Tinder <laughs> just to get a different perspective, like meet somebody outside of my circle so that I get a different perspective on how other people live their lives. Thank you so much yeah. for sharing that. <laughs> Thank you. Please do come to the front and we'll um, see how many we can get through in the next five or six minutes. Or yell. I'm going to listen to all of you. One simple word, but most powerful, I got from all of you was said by Mohandas Bhai. Rebel. Rebel. I want to respond to that question. For that, I remember a small village in Sri Lanka. Today, Sri Lanka is in the news. A 14-year-old girl has given an answer to me. A village called Ramanaguda, 400 miles from Colombo. I spent a whole day and night there. A 14-year-old girl gets up and asks me, You people from India, why are you people telling lies, lies, lies to your children all their life? I was shocked. I will tell you the lies. Then she said, who will believe in this world that there was a man with ten heads? Ravana. Ten heads, Ravana. And that village name is Ravana Guda. Because I don't go into the details and take time. I said, you are my guru. I told her. My teacher, when I was in fourth class, I was nine years old, came one day, brought the globe, and kept on the table and told, children, this is a world. I was sitting in the front. I, How do you know? He did not answer. He had a scale and he bet me on my thigh. Finish. I kept quiet. I decided I must find whether this is true. The world is round. It took 20 years for me. When I was 29 years, I found the world is round because I went on my feet, but I simple, I'll finish. A simple question I asked one person in Paris. Why do you make, as a bombs here, take all the way to the uh, uh, islands, Pacific Islands, experiment here? Please experiment it in Paris. <laughs> the answer I got, I was arrested by 50 policemen, put me in prison and deported from England, from Paris. This is the world in which we are living. And now, last point, five days ago, what happened? In the greatest democracy of the world, greatest democracy of the world, you know that. And we are the largest democracy of the world. But five days ago, what happened? I have got an email here with me. I got it four days ago. It says three, four sentences. I'll quote here. I am sick and tired. We have to act. And don't tell me we can't have an impact on this carnage. Texas school carnage, okay? Then he says, it's time to turn this pain into action for every parent and for every citizen of this country, the greatest democracy. We have to make it clear to every elected official in this country that it's time to act. It's time for those who obstructed the way, who have blocked the common sense, gun laws, to know we will not forget. Who sent this email? President of America sent it to me four days ago. I got it. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Why I get it, I'll tell you. When I was walking through Wilmington, the whole Wilmington gave me a reception. He was a little boy there. I congratulate him on being the president. We need to see two democracies in this world must come together, change the world with that word, rebel, rebel, rebel to the young people of the world. Thank you. Thank you. We've got time for a couple of questions. If there's a couple of questions or comments. Yep. Please. Thank you. I just introduced myself. I am Dr. Jagdish Chinnappa. I am work at the Manipal Hospital in the pediatric department. I've been around for around 40 years now practicing. 
So um, I'm going to tell just two stories, very short stories. The first story is a personal story. My daughter, uh, uh, we are both doctors, me and my wife, and everybody thought that she's going to go the pursue the same way and become a doctor. But then she was under Madam. And she, yes, in, you might remember her in Baldwin School, Madhvi Jagdish. Okay, so she then decided not to do medicine. And she went into uh, design. And today she's a very, uh, very accomplished designer, I must say. And it's primarily because of the influences as a child. So we are very grateful to Prasad and Jurek for, uh, for, for that, for, for allowing her to go on the path she wanted to go. The second is the professional part. I heard the very nice stories from the two youngsters, and we deal with adolescents on an everyday basis. And I can say today, all adolescents live in two worlds, the real world and the virtual world. And one thing which they lack is the mindset. They are lost in mental noise. They don't have the mindset to realize what they are doing. Everything is on remote control. They just act remotely. Sometimes they forget to eat, sometimes they forget to drink, they fun sometimes they forget to sleep because they're all the time preoccupied. They need time for calmness in the mind. And there has to be time to, for, for them to get into that mindset. I'll tell you, we handle children with eating disorders, with anorexia, nervosa, with bulimia. All these children don't realize. They all look at social media. They say, I must be thin like that girl in that picture. You see, so handling them is extremely important. And for the solutions, we have two solutions. One at my center, we have a psychologist for the last 10 years mm -hmm. who handles these children, who's a trained adolescent psychologist. And the Indian Academy of Pediatrics has got a very good program going to schools. Please remember, these children come from very elite schools where they got an outlet. But if you go to many of the smaller schools, there's no outlet. So, you, so we have a training program of life skills education for these adolescents. So That's these are great. some of the things we are doing. So I just thank you. Like thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, we are at eight o'clock and I'm very loath to do this, but I have to say a huge thank you to our panel. I have to close the discussion. Thank you so much. And what I got tonight was uh, a sense that if we keep the conversations going, if we talk about what is causing the unhappiness without being defensive, we have the most successful country in the world and we are going to show the world we are that. Thank you, everyone. That's true. You know, Vandana, you didn't give the youngest member of our audience a chance to say something. Okay. He's right yes, there actually, front, Andre. So I'd love to know what his takeaway was. Um, Andre, one takeaway. One takeaway from the discussion today. Come here. I put you in a spot, but I really want to know what you thought of. It's today. completely up to you, Andre. If anything, you don't feel anything that you thought of. It's up to you. <laughs> You'll definitely find something to say. Did you enjoy yourself? Did you did you sort of uh, uh, appreciate anything that you heard today? Will you remember anything of what yeah, you what heard today? Yeah, what will you remember from this discussion? Oh, what did you say? What did you say about? Uh, I think education and entertainment. Edutainment. Yeah. So, so what you're saying is that you would like teachers to be more entertaining when yeah. they're teaching you. Yes. Yeah. Where do you study? Bolan International School. And do you have fun in class? Do, you, do your teachers engage you? Do any of your teachers um, sort of make you feel like you're looking forward to their class? Yes. So you do have that. That's very good. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andre. <laughs> thank you, everyone, and have a lovely evening.